All right. I apologize for these little technical issues. Uh, my name is Selman Hikes. I'm the founder and CEO of DotCloud. Uh, and really quickly, we're a platform as a service. So our job is to make developers productive, uh, ideally 10 times more productive than they are. So we've deployed, scaled, and managed uh, hundreds of thousands of applications for tens of thousands of developers. Uh, but this is not a presentation about .cloud. Um, this is a presentation about the state of the art in creating software, how it's changed, and um, why that matters to probably all of us here. So before I continue, really quickly, who here has professionally written code at some point or does today? And all right, so I'd say a, a nice half of the room. And who uh, interacts directly with developers on a day-to-day -day basis at their work, whether you manage them or depend on them or wait for them to ship, all that kind of stuff. All right, so for those of you who are not developers, uh, let me just ponder a little bit on what it means to be a developer in, in 2012. Um, it's awesome. It's basically really nice to write software as a job because software is very important. And it's important to all of us, no matter the industry, no matter what we do. Um, in every industry you can think of, someone out there right now is disrupting that industry severely by moving faster than everyone else using software, right? And like our friend Mark Andreessen said recently, software is eating the world. I think that's a great way to say it. Um, if you're a business, you need to go fast because that's how you win. And these days, uh, a really, really important way to move fast is to make your developers more productive, to write software, to ship it faster than everyone else, come up with um, uh, better software ideas uh, before others do. Um, so the big question that uh, I hear a lot, talking to developers, talking to technical leaders as a vendor, a, a provider of services, is how? How do we do that? Uh, and so over time, talking to a lot of those successful teams and successful businesses and successful developers, we've com kind of compiled a list of things that these people do that makes them successful. And um, we're here to, I am here to share this list and discuss it with you. So, you know, we've called it the seven rules of cloud native development because it sounds cool. Really, it's a starting point for a conversation. So take it, take it for, as that. Um, and here they are, but really, I don't want to go through them now. We're going to go through them one by one. Uh, rule number one, and that's really the most important one, think services, not servers. There is a really big change going on in how applications are architected. Uh, and the best way to describe it is to first look at what your last application probably looks like. It's one big blob of something. It's code uh, written in the language of your choice, running on an application server of your choice, and connecting to your favorite database. And it's, it's a monolithic architecture most of the time, which means as your application evolves, as you need to improve it, uh, make it more scalable, add features, you need to go back in there and rework the code. Um, and new team members have to learn how that code worked in the first place, et cetera. Uh, contrast this with probably what your next application looks like. It's a very loosely coupled set of components. And each of those components performs a, a simple task, a very specific task, and performs it hopefully really well. Um, and in this architecture, uh, these components are called services, right? And you can think of services uh, as libraries that run themselves. Uh, and so just like libraries, these services uh, package uh, a neat set of uh, software functionality that you can use and reuse and, uh, and, and share in a very convenient way. Unlike libraries, they also package the hardware capabilities, right? They, they include the, the compute power, the storage, the network connectivity, and the 24-7 the ops that essentially make a service this black box that's always on that you can interact with remotely over an API, over the network, and it does things for you. And that is, just, that is really game changing. So some of you will say, well, that, that sounds familiar. That's so well all over again. And in a way, yes. And in another way, it's very different because now it's available to everyone in every setting. Uh, it's available to web developers, to mobile developers. It's available whether you're building a desktop app or up adding features to an existing application. Uh, it's, it's going mainstream, and it means there's no reason not to go for that architecture from day one. And that's really what, what's game changing, is the, 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 the broadness of it. Which leads me to rule number two, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, if your application looks like this, uh, it's a set of services that depend on each other. One question is, okay, which of those services should I write? Should I spend my time on? And which of them should I not? Should I reuse from someone else? And really, 
uh, again, ta from talking to a lot of these teams, um, it boils down to what differentiates you, right? What's special about this app that you're writing that makes it worth your time and your money? Uh, and once you find that, usually it's, it's one thing or a small number of things, and really what you wanna do is spend all of your energy making that awesome, making it really, really good, ideally the best in the market, and spend as little energy as possible on everything else. You wanna outsource everything else. And service-oriented architectures, cloud services, make that really easy, they make it possible, because there are services out there that perform these other tasks that you don't wanna do really well. There are companies supporting them, and um, I wanted to bring one example of this. Uh, Justin Can is the CEO and founder of a company called Exec. Uh, Exec is a recently launched company that does on-demand workforce. It's, it's really nice, you should check it out. Uh, and I've talked to Justin about this, this, this practice, and they launched in uh, a matter of months with a team of three, uh, and they did that by heavily leaning on as many cloud surfaces as they could. They did payment with Stripe, they sent and received text messages with Twilio, they sent and received emails with Mailgun, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, to quote Justin, they could not have done that so fast uh, and with a team so small without leaning in all these cloud services. So that's the kind of uh, practice methodology that, it, that you wanna aim for. Rule number three, don't create silos. So. This has to do with how, how teams are created and, and grow over time. A lot of teams, a lot of organizations have teams organized like this, right? You, you tend to group people by their specialty. So you have the web dev guys, the, the database guys, the ops guys, et cetera. And then as products are built and projects come along, uh, they kind of go through these teams in an elaborate process. It's well documented. Um, and it's kind of like you know the different steps in a, in a factory as the car is being assembled. Uh, and the problem with that is, is creates a lot of a dependency and you have a lot of people waiting on each other. Uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of these organizations, a lot of these teams that are successful in shipping fast and, and disrupting their markets, uh, organize teams differently. They build um, cross-functional teams uh, that focus on, that organize around products. Uh, and, and really you could summarize that in a few rules. One team for one product, right? Uh, don't have one team deal with lots of different products because they're gonna lose their focus. And also, don't have one product owned by lots of different teams because then that will confuse, that will create confusion as to the ownership, right? Who's responsible for what? So if a, a team essentially becomes the smallest possible group of people who can ship. If, it, if they can ship, the team's working. If they can't ship, maybe you're missing someone. And then you can pick and choose from whatever specialty you need, right? Uh, and one last important point here, um, this is something we hear again and again, the people who write the code should be the people running it. And that means if you need to bring ops specialists into the team, do it. If you can outsource that work with the cloud service where that can outsource ops, that's great. But that unit of people, that group, has to be responsible for what they write, for running it. Um, and we'll get to that later. Hmm. Okay. Which leads me to rule number four, don't get in the way of the developer. And that's a question we get a lot also. So, you know, the, the, the concern is, okay, we're supposed to organize a project, products, uh, trust this product with, to, to a team uh, of cross-functional team that is highly autonomous and figures things out as it goes without this elaborate process of going to the DBA and authorizing the, the, the schema change, et cetera. But isn't that, going to produce something that I can't control, me the leader of this organization, right? I have needs, my business have, has needs. Uh, there's a spec here, I can't just throw a, a, loosely, you know, a group of people at a problem and hope something good happens. Uh, and that is very true, right? So you need to be, and we all need to be very uh, disciplined about the functional requirements, the business requirements. Uh, and, and that includes things like, it has to ship by Christmas, right? Or, 100,000 people have to be able to use it at the same time because that's how many people are gonna show up. Uh, these are legitimate, important requirements, but a lot of times we find that they are mixed together with technical requirements, not the what, but the how, right? You'll start saying things like, well, we're a Java shop, so of course you guys should use Java to write this. Or, you know, um, oh, I heard this thing is cool, I talked to this vendor yesterday, or I heard about this language, you, you guys use it. Uh, and by doing that, you're shooting yourself in the foot, well, you know, you're shooting in your team's foot, collective foot, and um, you're, you're preventing them from, from holding their side of the bargain, which is be responsible for shipping. Um, and 
again and again we see this, this trend of if you can separate the two and be firm on the functional requirements and flexible on the technical requirements, then the result is that, that the team can reach out and try whatever tool is best for the job. They're, that's the purpose of cloud services, right? They're out there, they're available, they're always on. There, there is almost always a free version you can try with. These guys uh, know what they're doing. Uh, that's why you hired them. So let them do it. And then as an organization, provide them with guidance and support along the way when they come back with the choice of tools so that uh, you can help them make sure the vendor is appropriate. You can figure out the budget, et cetera, et cetera. So, the idea is not to isolate that from the rest of the organization, but to let the builders build. Rule number five, cookie cutter first, customize later. Uh, and that is really a different way of saying don't over-engineer. That rule may seem very obvious, and it is. It's an old rule, um, but when you're switching to a new model, there's a tendency, I mean, one of the amazing things is you can rewrite the rules, you can challenge old rules, and sometimes some, some old rules should be challenged, and some rules you just really don't want to mess with, and that is such a rule. Uh, just don't over-engineer, don't do it. Um, everyone thinks they're this unique snowflake, oh, but I have this custom need, I can't possibly store data like everyone else, it's different. Uh, probably not. In fact, when it is different, uh, it, it should be different on the pieces that differentiate you, right? If back to rule, I forget which rule, the rule that says focus on the red box. That's the rule you should follow, and that's where you can think of about customizing. But think of customizing as something very expensive and slow. Uh, it's like a gun with only two bullets in it, right? May, maybe three if you're lucky. Uh, you gotta think really uh, carefully about when you're gonna fire that bullet. So I wanna talk about an example of that. Uh, Scott Vandenplass is the lead DevOps at uh, Obama from America, or was, right? He, he took care of everything that had to do with servers throughout the campaign, and these guys dealt with an amount of scale and complexity that scares me just to think about it, and they also had to move very, very fast, so it's a very interesting use case. Um, and so the problem we talked about uh, was monitoring, right? The, uh, Scott was responsible for monitoring this incredibly complex uh, stack, um, and he was faced with the decision of what tool to use to do it. And so even though he knew he would have incredible scale problems along the way, he decided to start with the plain old Nagios. And if you're familiar with Ops, Nagios is a tried and true monitoring tool. It's been around for 15 years. And they picked it because it was familiar and reliable. They knew when picking it that it would break in some, some fashion at some point. They just weren't sure how. So they picked it and they kept an eye on it. And when it did break, they, they spotted the problem, zeroed in on the part of it that broke, and I'll spare you the details, but it had to do with communication between different components, unsurprisingly. They ripped out that piece, replaced it with something custom, um, and, and continued along, and ended up with something that was still Nagios, 80% Nagios, with just enough customization, and they had wasted no more time than they needed to. So the lesson here, I think, is that if these guys start with cookie cutter, so can you and so can we. Um, rule number six, experiment quickly. Um, and so really that's one of the interesting properties of cloud services and service-oriented uh, architectures. Um, you wanna be able to ship things fast and, and adapt to your market, but you also wanna do that um, down the road, right? Everyone's fast on day one. There's, you're starting from scratch. But one year in, when you have users and customers and demands uh, and feedback keep rolling in and you have to keep adapting, keep iterating, you're, you're, you've got to keep fighting to stay on top, how do you do that as fast as you were in the first day? How do you avoid gradually slowing down until you're just bogged down by all these features and you just can't move anymore and then you're dead? So the way you do that, or at least the way Isaac did it. Isaac is the um, CTO of Six Wunderkinder, a German startup. Um, and they, hmm, little formatting problem here, um, they reached one million users in nine months with their first app. Um, and so that is really basically overnight. And they reached this incredible number of users and they were not ready. They were still figuring out the, the, prob the problem they were solving. They were still adding features to the product. Uh, and they knew that if they slowed down the pace of evolution of the app because of this huge number of users, they would, they would, you know, someone would catch up to them. So it was really critical 
for them to keep moving fast. Uh, and, and ISA could leverage this, this service-oriented architecture to do that. And the way he did it was each new feature was its own service, and he gave the developers in charge of that feature complete flexibility over how to do it. So each new feature could use a different language, a new database, a, a totally different stack. It was up to them to find the right tool for the job. And they could make those decisions without affecting the existing code base in any way because there was a clean isolation between services um, and, without, um, and, and without slowing this new feature down, right? Without uh, forcing upon this new feature decisions made for another feature. And the result is they were able to keep iterating at the same uh, uh, speed uh, and they, they kept shipping features in a matter of days, uh, sometimes weeks, max, to this million users and, and got to product market fit. Rule seven, final rule, ship every day. So this is similar to another rule which is you know, we, you hear a lot, a, a lot about the agile, pro, the agile process, uh, release early, release often. This, this is different. This is about using deployment um, as a tool even before you've launched, right? So a lot of times we talk to, to people, and this may seem obvious to, to you guys, uh, we talked to, to teams who built a perfect product. It's all ready to go. They're launching tomorrow. It's awesome. All they've got to do is put it up on the servers. It's still on the laptops, right? And that is a really big problem because they really don't know if it works. Um, because as I'm sure you know, the, the environment has not, the cloud environment is just not the same as a laptop. It's just never gonna be. Um, so you really need to deploy from day one in the cloud. Even if it's well, one line of code, a hello world, it doesn't matter. Put it up there, go through the practice of creating this environment, create a sandbox essentially that duplicates, that replicates the production environment um, and then let your developers play in that sandbox. Uh, that's the, the beauty of cloud services and, and service-oriented architecture. It's really easy to replicate an entire stack of services and have essentially a clone that you can mess with uh, and you can do whatever you want with. You can show uh, an experimental feature to, to, to your teammates, you can show it to your clients, you can select a subset of your customers and A-B test a feature. Um, you can, you can even do something that increasingly teams do, which is give each developer their own sandbox. And I mean the entire a replica of the entire stack and say, this is, the entire, this is your version of the whole thing, have fun. And now you have developers individually uh, able to do incredible things on their own without asking anyone for permission. Uh, and again, it's all about speed, right? So the, the faster that cycle is to shipping something and getting feedback on it, the faster you are gonna, you're gonna go, and the, the faster you'll get to, to shipping. So that's, that's something we really encourage uh, everyone to do. And this is the only plug, I think, in the, in the entire presentation. Um, we as a vendor have, have made it a point to make that process possible. So we, we insisted on um, offering unlimited and free sandboxes for all the cloud services we offer. And we, we hope that every competitor will do the same because that is really the way applications should be built. So, in summary, it's all about speed. You wanna to go to market as fast as you can, and uh, developer productivity is an extremely important way to get there. There are a lot of little wins all along the way uh, that may not seem um, like a silver bullet, but if you combine them, they, they end up multiplying and giving you a 10x uh, advantage, and that's true across every industry. So that was the seven rules of cloud native development. I'm happy to take any questions if I have time left. Thank you all for staying. Yeah.